All right, guys, I am so, so, so excited to dive into this discussion with y'all today. And we are talking about how we take these aspirations that we're gonna be thinking about today. And whenever you leave a conference, we all know conference syndrome where you go and you get a ton of great ideas and you write a ton of notes. And then sometimes they gather dust and they gather guilt because we don't do anything with them and we go back to our day to day. And so today is also kind of how to take these grand ideas and start to move them into action through the vehicle of your own personal vision. So I wanted to start off by talking about what I've been hearing from leaders lately. And Deborah and Scott, you were my first two to walk in. So I would love for you guys to read these things. And then Cheryl, would you read the third one? It's going to be one. You're going to read one. You're going to read the second one. You're going to read the third one. They're just like two sentences long. All right, Deborah, we're going to start off with you. These are some of the things that I've been hearing verbatim from leaders. I'm just looking for clarity on where I want to go for the next part of my life. Okay. What about this one? Without that vision and clarity, there's no chance of taking the first step because I don't know which way I'm stepping. And what about this third one, Cheryl? Get stuck there. Do any of these resonate with you guys? Does any of that sound familiar? Okay, all right. So the thing about these kind of comments and ideas and questions that people are asking themselves and things that people are talking about that they need, it's universal. And over the past 10 years, I have heard this from leaders in so many different types of industries, so many different types of jobs and roles, and so many different countries. And so that's where I started to. And so 10 years ago, I was going through a transition in my life. I was sort of at a crossroads. And just, if, I know you guys have been walking around, but just stand up if you are currently going through some kind of transition. Yeah, 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 exactly, right? Exactly, yes. Transition in the back, right? So I was going through a transition. I felt like I was at this inflection point, right? You can just kind of feel it. You can just kind of sense that you're heading out of one era and you're, on the cusp of this next era, and I had all these huge questions. And I knew that I had a choice. I could be at that inflection point and I could be proactive and intentional about where I was headed, or I could be reactive, right? And ultimately, I could just kind of take the path of least resistance. I could just let life happen to me. And to be honest, it would be great. Like my life would still be great right now. It would, it would still be great. Or I could again be really proactive and intentional. And I knew that if I was, life was going to be messier and more challenging and harder. And I was gonna have to be more honest with myself. And I also knew it was gonna be way juicier and way more exhilarating and way more exciting to figure out the path to get where I wanted to go and then actually end up there. So I had this question when I was 25 years old, what do I want my life to look like when I'm 30? Right, and that's an exciting question and it is a scary question. And so normally when you're at that inflection point in your life, your first question is, all right, well, which way do I go? Path A or path B, right? But I was incredibly fortunate because I worked at this amazing company called Zingerman's. Do I have any other Midwesterners in the room? Okay, okay, so it's based in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And you wouldn't think that a tiny little corner deli would have taught me about vision, but everything, everything at Zingerman starts with a vision. And I, I mean literally everything. So if they're launching a new product, they're gonna come together and say, well, what's the vision? If they're going into the busy holiday season, they're gonna ask, what's the vision for this? If they're going into their annual planning cycle, as you guys might be going into as we look to 2024, they're gonna ask, what's the vision? Because in their minds, how could you possibly create the vision if you don't, I'm sorry, how could you possibly create the plan if you don't know what you're planning for? Right, right? Already resonating? Okay, I love it. Head nods were so good. So even though when I was working at Zingerman's, I was bringing huge Reuben sandwiches to people and I was like literally covered in pickle juice up to the elbows every day, I was learning about vision. And it was so formative at that time in my life. And so I got to this point where I said, okay, well, I've seen how vision can kind of work in a company but I could use this tool for myself. And so I, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to tell you all the great things about Zingerman's. Because of their vision, they managed to grow into this multi, multi-million dollar organization without ever franchising. So for them, the reason why they are written up in all these incredible publications is because through their vision, they chose to grow in a really different way. And that allowed them to really maintain their incredible culture as they've grown. So back to this question that I had. And what I did was I learned to ask that different question. Again, not which way do I go, 
Because if you think about it, it's so easy to get just stuck at the crossroads and we kind of get tunnel vision. And then our mind, it's like, ding, 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 path A or path B, path A, path B, path A, path B. And that's all we can seem to think about. And we're just going through the pros and cons list and asking our friends and asking our network and trying to decide. But that's not really the question, right? And if you ask different questions, you get different answers. And so Zingerman's taught me to ask a different question, which is where am I even going? Right? Because once I figure out where I'm going, I can work backwards and it's, becoming, it's going to become so much more clear, so much more quickly. Do I take path A? Do I take path B? Do I make an entirely different path? Do I take a helicopter? Do I, right? Like what is going on? It opens me up to all these other possibilities that I didn't even and wouldn't even have imagined if I just stayed in that question, which way do I go? It just becomes very binary and you could just get stuck there, sort of zooming out and really, really exploring all those options and possibilities. So I literally just locked myself in a room for an entire weekend. I had a lot of snacks and I just wrote and I wrote and I wrote and I asked myself those questions, not like, what are my goals and my hopes and dreams that I've been walking around with? But like, what do I really, really, really want that is so core to who I am that it is going to remain true over this next half decade of my life? 25 to 30, you know, that's a, a very formative five years. Now, whatever age you are, the next five years is a very formative five years, right? Those half decade chunks, right? A lot happens. Things become relevant, things become irrelevant. And so when we really, really dig down and ask ourselves that question, then we can get to that point where at the end of that weekend, I had my vision for every aspect of my life, personal, professional, financial, spiritual, relational, for five years from that exact day. And I knew what it was gonna look like. And it was so incredibly exciting and inspiring. And I also realized that I didn't want anyone to ever have to go through that process alone. It is so hard to go through it alone. And even if you have the discipline or the craziness to lock yourself in a room for the weekend, it's really hard to ask yourself those questions. We need someone to kind of draw those questions out of us. And so today I'm gonna be bringing some of those questions up so you guys get to start thinking about what that looks like for you. The other thing I realized as I kind of went out into the world after having my own vision in place is that there were a lot of common things that kind of kept people back from clarifying their vision. So one is that, oh my gosh, just even thinking about the next five years is completely and utterly daunting. So daunting, right? Just even to put ourselves in that situation of asking those questions, knowing we're gonna have to be honest with ourselves. And I also have people who say, I don't really wanna ask myself the question because I kinda already know the answer. And once I really solidify that answer, I'm gonna have to take the action, right? That's gonna necessitate action. I actually don't know if I'm ready for that. And I completely get that. Now, amazing things still happen when you get that clarity, but that's a really valid reason to feel like it's pretty daunting to look forward, right? Another is that I'm just not wired that way. Like, I'm not a visionary. I'm amazing at the tactics. I can, you know, set my three-year professional development plan, but like, thinking about the vision, isn't that like, you know, all these big people that we hear about, all these gurus out in the world? But the thing is, this is a learned skill just like everything else. They do not teach visioning in schools, right? So if you don't feel like you have that muscle, amazing, none of us do, we have to build it, right? It can absolutely be learned and you just grow that muscle by using it. And then there's also people who say, yeah, like vision, like a vision board, right? Like I did that once, I like cut out some collage pictures, like it is in my closet, it didn't do anything for me. And other people who say, I had a vision board, everything came true, it was awesome, but what now? Right, but you might find that this, this idea of vision just like as a visual doesn't really resonate. Or that when you hear these gurus talking about manifesting your dream life and thinking about your perfect future, you just feel like it's kind of cringy. I definitely do. Or you're reading these personal development books and listening to these podcasts that continue to tell you how important it is to have a vision, but no one tells you what it really means and no one tells you how to do it. Right, so you're kind of left with like, great, thanks. I should have a vision, what now? And then, right, sometimes we go at it where we feel like, okay, well, maybe I'm not wired that way and maybe I'm not really ready to ask those bigger questions, so I'm just gonna go hardcore productivity. I'm just gonna do as much as I can every single day and it'll all just kind of work itself out, right? Yeah, a little bit of that, a little bit of that happening, okay. So 
like I said before, these are universal issues. You guys are in very good company, literally with your fellow people in this room and people all around the world. And so the next thing I wanna do is shift over to help you guys think a little bit about the root causes that are going on in your own world that are kind of holding you, again, holding you back specifically from clarity. And when I hear these things coming up from people, to me, they're symptoms. They're symptoms of uncertainty. They're symptoms of a hazy vision. And again, it's not bad or wrong to have a hazy vision. No one taught you how to do it, right? And so that's what I'm here to teach you today. But I also want you to approach these with curiosity. This isn't about judging yourself and feeling like, oh, I have five of those symptoms, what's wrong? It's more about, oh, that's kind of interesting. I wonder where that's coming from and what's at play and what that symptom is really leading to. What, what other symptom is that, is that symptom creating? So as I talk through these five, just make a note on your page if, you hit, if I talk about one that you really feel like that's me. And most people will say, I think I'm all five, but I'm gonna challenge you to really get down the one that you feel is really the root cause for you. So the first one is gaining clarity. It's important, it's just not urgent. You're firefighting every day, right? And at work, you knock one fire out and two more erupt over here. And then you get those two out and then four more erupt over here. And just every day you're constantly in firefighting mode. And sure, like this idea of long-term thinking sounds great. You read about it, about it in the books, you hear about it in the podcasts, right? But it always falls to the bottom of your list. And one of the reasons it falls to your bottom, the bottom of your list is because you don't know where to start. So who could blame you for letting it fall off your list because everything else on your list you know how to do. So of course you're gonna attack the things that you know how to do and not try to do something that you don't even know where to begin with or something that feels so incredibly daunting. So if you feel like this is you, if you feel like you're always in firefighting mode, you always find yourself saying, yeah, 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 I, wa I wanna take a step back. I wanna think big picture. I wanna think about where I'm headed. Only problem is I just don't have time. Then make a note on your page. And the reason that I say that's a symptom is because when I see people in kind of that frantic, all over the place mode, oftentimes they're not using their energy and their time and their effort and their resources in the way that's gonna serve them best because they're, again, not really sure where they're going. So it's all kind of fragmented. Now, the next one is there's just something missing. And this one might be you. If you have a fantastic life, for all intents and purposes, you have a great life. But just as you reach this inflection point in your own life, as you head into this new chapter, as you kind of wrap up the last chapter that you've been in, you just feel like you can't quite put your finger on it, just something isn't feeling aligned. And it's kind of weird because you're thinking, well, if I kind of have a great life, like, is how could my vision really be different? I don't necessarily want some big crazy thing. I don't want some huge other, you know, big idea of what my life could look like that's so massively different. So what's even the point, right? But it still just feels like there is something missing. And so if that's you, if you can feel it internally, then I want you to make a note, one, make a note of that one on your page. And the reason that this is a symptom is because so often it's because we're feeling misaligned but we can't, again, articulate or put our finger on what is misaligned. And so when you can't really put your finger on it, you can't kind of name it, you don't even know what to do with it. You just feel it. You just feel it. The third is a fear of specificity. Now, this one shows up in a few different ways. Who are my multi-passionate people in the room? Okay, 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 okay. So some people are like, whoa, whoa, whoa do not box me in. Do not make me write a vision where I'm gonna have to say, I'm gonna do this and this is gonna be my future because I wanna be open and I wanna explore and I don't wanna be held back from all that, right? Now, the secret, of course, is that your vision will always open you up. It's never gonna close you off from the right opportunities, but I totally get why that feels like, oh, I don't wanna touch that. I don't wanna be boxed in or held back. I don't want a vision that's so rigid that I can't change and move and be flexible. Now, on the other hand, I have people, just yesterday I was talking to a CEO who said, and he's in this CEO round table with all these other amazing CEOs and he's done incredible things in his business. And his biggest fear was that he's not gonna be thinking big enough and that he's gonna go to his team and talk to, about his vision and they're gonna look at him like, that's it, right? So people think, what if my vision's too small? What if I write the wrong vision? What if my vision is too big and I never get there, right? So they have all these questions and the fear of really getting down to that absolutely holds them back. So if that's you, make a note of that one. Then we've got our adorable little squirrel, shiny object syndrome. I'm seeing all, a lot of head nods for this one already. So when, does the, when do the squirrels get hit? 
when they like second guess themselves and go back the other way. That's when they always get hit, right? And so that's us sometimes. Like we're, we're going, we're going, we're excited. Then we come to a conference, we're like, oh, that's the best new thing. And then we completely go this other way. We run back and then bad things happen. So if you are that person who is multi-passionate, but it isn't serving you so well because your energy does feel like it's fragmented, you feel like you're pulled in all these different directions, you might be say you might be one of those people who says, I'm really good at starting things, not so great at finishing things, right? This might be you. So if you are that adorable little squirrel, make a note of that one on your page. And then team. So when I say team, of course we've got your team in your work, but you've also what you guys think about your home team, right? So this one, again, there's a lot going on with this one. But if you are somebody who says, I have spent the last chapter of my life really worrying about everyone else's vision and making sure that they got the success that they needed. And I haven't actually had like more than 22 seconds to think about my own vision, right? This might be you. If you feel like everyone has different competing ideas of what that vision looks like, and so we can't get on the same page, we're not rowing in the same direction. Or what if I have a really big vision and my partner doesn't? I feel like I actually need to have like a whole class of what to do, what to expect when your partner is clarifying their vision. Because th there is something that happens when one partner is really kind of going down that path and the other is still really hazy on where they're headed. There can be some conflict there, right? So if you feel like team dynamics, either in your work or at home, are kind of that symptom that you are uncertain about which way you're headed, you're kind of hazy on the vision, then I want you to write that one down. So as you look at these and think about which resonates most, just put your hand up if important but not If that was you, just put your hand up. Okay, what about number two? What about there's something missing? Okay, fear, fear of specificity. Okay, shiny object syndrome. Yes, okay, and then last one, team. Okay, so we had a pretty even distribution. So when you leave this session, I want you again, really, really think about that. That, that issue is symptomatic of something for you, right? And you could just put a Band-Aid on that thing, but that's just a Band-Aid, right? That's not curing the actual thing at the root cause. So really do that work for yourself to get down to what that root cause is. Now, I wanna talk about really transforming goals into a vision because so many people that I connect with say, I've always been a goal setter. I'm really good at goals. So like, what's the difference between vision and goals? Why would I want a vision instead of goals? All these big questions come up. So let's, let's kind of break it down. So one thing is that even if you have always been a goal setter, and even if you've always been great at achieving your goals, goals can kind of at some point feel like they are just a check the box. Not super satisfying, not super fulfilling, just check in that box. The next is that I have people come to me that say, I've kind of run out of goals. Like I did everything I set out to do, right? And a lot of them still have half a life or more than half a life ahead of them. So they're asking, what is next? Right? Yes, yes, yes. So that is, again, can be a very exciting and a very daunting question. So if you feel like you've checked all the boxes that you have been always told to check as a society, and now you've kind of check them all, like what, what's next? A lot of people feel like they're just kind of floating around. They're working, they're putting in a lot of time and effort and they're doing a lot of stuff, but like, where am I even going in all of this? And then third, goal setting often leads to shooting all over yourself. Just all, all over yourself. Because oftentimes we go into this mode of, okay, let me sit down, goals for 2024. Well, I should do this and I should do more self-care. I should really do a lot more relaxation and meditation, right? Exactly, right? So we get like amped up, like militantly, we have to relax, right? And so it's all this shoulding about what I should do, what I shouldn't do, what I should be able to do, what I shouldn't I be able to do the thing that they're doing, right? If you're if this is you and I'm feeling a lot of, I'm seeing a lot of these head nods for this one, if this is you, again, know that you're not alone. This is sort of a natural thing that pops up when we go to do traditional goal setting. So the other thing that I find is that sometimes people say, it feels like my goals are screaming at me from my planner or on the screen or whatever, whatever it might be. They are screaming at me. They are pushing me in a negative way. It feels like a push push, 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 right? Feels like a nag, feels like that thing that we don't wanna do. So we procrastinate, we put it off, our resistance increases. 
instead of being a pull, something that pulls us forward in a positive way. And that's a really, really different feeling. And you can feel it immediately if something is that negative push or if it's a positive pull. So let's move in to vision. What I mean when I say vision. Okay, we've talked about goals, but like what's this vision thing all about? So when I say the word vision, what's the first thing that comes to mind? Just shout it out. End goal. Big picture, long term. Anything else? Aspirational, love it. Okay, and we're going to talk about the aspirational, so I'm glad you brought that one up. So oftentimes when we think of vision, we also think of it in terms of a vision statement, like you might see at an organizational level, or there might be a product vision or a project vision, right? And usually maybe it's a couple sentences long. Sometimes it's like, you know the, uh, the, the magnetic poetry? Sometimes I feel like if you just like got business buzzwords in magnetic poetry and then just like threw them at a magnetic thing, like that's our vision statement. It sounds great, it is very fancy. People might know it by heart, doesn't really do anything to people. So this is often where people land when, when I say that word vision, or they've done the vision board thing and they're like, wow, rainbows, butterflies, great, have fun with that vision, so cute for you, right? So you may be on either side of that spectrum, but we are talking about something really different. We're talking about what I call a deep dive vision, right? And a deep dive vision is your definition of success at a specific point in the future. Your definition of success at a specific point in the future. And so we've got these two really critical elements here. Number one, it is your definition of success, not anybody else's. And you might be sitting there thinking, well, I've got a partner or I've got a family or I've got a co-founder, how in the world could this just be about me? Trust me, you need to clarify your own, they need to clarify their own, then you can see where things align and misalign, right? But this is your definition of success. It is not society's definition. It is not your family's definition or your friend's definition or social media's definition. It is also not your past self's definition of success. And a lot of times I see people who are chasing and chasing and chasing this definition of success that they've held onto for years and they've never actually given themselves a chance to take a step back and validate if that's actually still what they want. And maybe that was a really valid, helpful definition for your past self, but that doesn't mean it has to be the definition for this next chapter. This deep dive vision also isn't the vision for you five years from now, right? And sometimes the reason that vision feels so daunting is people are like, whoa, 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 you want me to like figure out the rest of my life? Well, that's how could I even possibly do that? The beauty is a deep dive vision I recommend it's either for three years or five years. Now, that's still a chunk of time, right? But we're talking about the next chapter of your life, not forever, the next chapter. And so often that in and of itself releases the pressure gauge for people because they realize, oh, like I want to do all these things. I may have all these aspirations, but you know, maybe that's my next vision. And so instead of feeling bad and guilty that I haven't done that thing yet, maybe I get to recognize that's part of my next vision. And this vision, I get to lay the foundation. And then you get to feel really good about that instead of guilty and bad. The next piece is that specific point in the future. And when I say specific, I mean a specific day of a specific month of a specific year specific. So my current vision is for May 24th, 2028, right? And the idea is I will literally get to that day of that month of that year. I will read my vision out loud and it will be the reality that I've created around me. Not because of some magic pill or a silver bullet or any woo woo, whatever. It's because I will have made intentional and proactive decisions to make that vision a reality every day. And when I get off track from that vision, I recognize it so much more quickly and I have the tools to get back on track. And I have said this phrase, right? I've done this, these types of presentations so many times and I wait for the time where it no longer gives me goosebumps to say, you get to that day of that month and you read it and it's your reality. Every time I get goosebumps. Every time, because I think about the amazing people that I've worked with who get to that day and they read their vision out loud and it is their reality. And it's incredible. And then they pause, they celebrate, and then they write their next vision. So let's talk about what a vision really is all about. When, when I kind of put that slide up about a vision statement and maybe it's one sentence, two sentences, a, a deep dive vision is a few pages long. Now, there's not a certain length it has to be, Mine's several pages long. I have another visionary I worked with. Hers is two pages long and it's brilliant. 
right? But it's more than two sentences. Can you imagine looking through a telescope and trying to describe everything that you see in like one sentence? I mean, you can do it, but it's pretty vague. Not super helpful. So we're really, really fleshing out the evidence that we've gotten to where we wanted to go in this vision. Now, it is also written in the present tense like it has already happened. So my vision for May 24th, 2028 is written like it is already 2028. And I'm thinking back over these past five years. And so there's something really, really incredible that happens in your brain when you are able to drop yourself into that space where you can see it and feel it and smell it and touch it and taste it like you are there. And your brain literally cannot distinguish, am I actually there? Do I actually know what that feels like? Or is it something I just kind of made up? And when we do that, then we, our brain is like, oh, I can totally do that. I can completely make that happen. I can absolutely make that a reality. I've already done it. And you're like, you haven't actually done it, right? But your brain doesn't need to know that. So when you create that powerful memory of the future, which I know sounds like an oxymoron, but it's a memory of the future, your ability to make it a reality skyrockets. Now, it is multifaceted. People will ask a lot of times, okay, okay, so do I have like a personal vision and then a separate professional vision or how does that work? And I want to tell you that you are all gorgeous diamonds. You are all gorgeous, beautiful diamonds, and you all have a lot of facets. And they're all facets of the same unified whole. And so your vision is, it is personal, and it's professional, and it's financial. And if spirituality resonates with you, it is about that. And if it doesn't, it's not. And it's about your relationships, right? It's about all those areas of your life. And going through that process really helps you take a look at, you know, we were talking about balance in the, in the earlier session, and it helps you kind of think about, well, if this is my definition of success for my professional life, well, how does that actually impact the financial piece and the, finan you know, the personal piece and the relational piece? Okay, let me think about that. And is there some misalignment? And do I want to think about that differently before I just kind of jump in? So we've kind of talked through vision, and now I want to dive into how we can use this vision, vision to supercharge your why. This is what this conference is all about our why, our purpose, right? Our own mission. So how can we use this vision to really, really make it shine? Whoever said aspiration in the back, I'm so glad you said that because when I think of your mission or your why, I think of that as aspirational. Now, different people in different companies describe vision and mission different ways. They're all valid. This is just the way that I talk about them in our language, shared language for today. So when I think about a mission, it's aspirational. It is out there in front of us like the North Star. We're never going to get there. We never can get there. The point is not actually to ever get there, right? It's something that's always going to pull us forward in a really positive way. But if you think about the sailors who navigated by the North Star, however long ago that was, no matter how hard they worked, no matter how far they traveled, did they ever even get one inch closer to the North Star itself? No. Nope. So if you have a why, that's amazing and it is inspiring. But if it's kind of floating out there on its own, it can be inspiring and it can also be completely exhausting because you are never going to get there. And that's where a vision comes in because it gives you a way to feel successful at different points along your journey. Now you're still guided by that why, you're still guided, you're pulled forward by that incredible North Star. But now you have a way where you can actually figure out how to live that thing. How do I live my why in this next chapter of my life? And not just how do I live that why professionally, but how do I live it personally? How do I live it in my relationships? How do I live it in the way that I'm growing my finances? Right? How do we live it in my spirituality? Again, if that is something that resonates with you. So then we've got our mission, we've got our vision, and now we got to figure out the plan to get there. What's the first thing that Google asks when you want to, you pull up Google Maps, what's the first thing it asks? Where are you going, right? The actual first thing it asks is where, well, no, I guess that is the first thing. Yeah, when I'm thinking about it. But the second, what is the second thing it asks? Where are you now? Exactly, right? Because even if you put an exact address into Google, the coordinates, and you cannot tell Google where you are now, it cannot give you directions. It can't. And so oftentimes we miss that step of really taking stock of where we are now and being really honest with ourselves about the current state. And so we kind of just like jump to the future. But again, 
we don't know where to go or how to, to which way to step because we don't know where we're starting from, right? So this plan is critical. Now, the other piece is what happens when you put a specific destination in, you've got your destination where you are now and you hit a roadblock. What does Google do? It reroutes you, totally. And when you're on a trip, is that frustrating? Can it be annoying? Sure, but do you have this kind of inner confidence that you know you're still gonna get to your destination? Absolutely, absolutely. And that ultimately is what a vision gives you, right? It gives you this sense that yes, my plan, the way that I'm gonna get there is gonna change time and time and time again. And I wanted to, right? That's some of the fun of life. If you knew exactly how you're gonna get from point A to point B, that would be like super boring. Right, so we want to be able to pivot and be flexible and change our plan. The idea is that the destination, where we are headed, that remains the same, right? That's not a moving target. And when I meet people who are feeling pulled in all these different directions, often it's because their path is always changing and their destination is always changing too. So now you've got these two things that are moving and you literally cannot navigate that way. You just can't do it. So let's take a look at how these all flow together. Our mission, is why, right? Why we are even going on this journey. Why? And especially when we're tired and especially when it's hard and especially when something didn't turn out the way that we wanted or we hit that proverbial roadblock, right? That is our why, why we are even going on this journey. Then our deep dive vision is where we are going. It is when we are going to get there and it is what it is going to look like when we arrive. Right? What is going to be the evidence that shows us that we have gotten to where we wanted to go? And then we've got our plan, how we are actually going to get there. But as you can see, the order matters. The order really matters, right? Because if you just start with the how and you're missing the why, the where, the when, the what, then you're essentially charting the course without determining the destination, right? We all know how that ends up. So like I talked about before, what this creates is this internal compass. And oftentimes after people clarify their vision, they just stand a little taller. They just kind of have this quiet confidence because it's like having that GPS in your car. Of course, things are going to happen that you're not expecting. Of course, you're going to get derailed. You're human. Like we can guarantee that's going to happen. But now instead of, oh gosh, well, what does this mean? And what do I do? And how did I? you're just like, oh, I was able to recognize really quickly that I'm off track. And now I have some tools to get back on track. And I know what that looks like. And here we, here we go. Keep going. So with that clarity comes speed. Now I will say your definition of success does not just have to be speed. And one of the traps that people fall into with goal setting is that goals always have to be more and better and more and better and more and better and more and better. And again, that in itself can feel really daunting and it's never enough. So I don't wanna put this idea, I don't wanna project this idea onto you that speed is what we're looking for at all costs. But what I mean is you can accelerate, you can get where you want to go and make things a reality way quicker than you thought possible because you have that clarity. So like I had a visionary who really, you know, I'd want to write a book forever. They had gone by the wayside, important but not urgent, important not urgent. It was a really important part of his vision and he had a five-year vision, but he wrote that book in the first year. After not doing it for 12 years, he did it in that first year, right? So that's what I mean when I say acceleration, not just like a race to the top. So as we think about vision, Vision really impacts your own personal decision making. And as you learn about these things, you're going to take this back and you're going to be putting this on your organization thinking, I can see this dynamic showing up there too. But for now, I want you to think about this on a personal level. So ultimately, when we are making decisions, it kind of falls into one of two camps, proactive decision making or reactive decision making. And there was a social scientist back in the 60s in the US named Ron Lippitt, and he studied different all different types of organizations, huge, corp huge corporations, small businesses, municipalities, you know, you name it, he studied it. And he found that there was really two different dynamics that he recognized when he was doing these studies. The first dynamic is what he called traditional problem solving, old school, traditional problem solving. Now I say old school, but this happens every day in all the ways all around us all the time. This is when you get into a room and, and again, you can imagine this happening in your business, but I'm going to ask you to think about it for yourself. You, you take a step back and you say, what's the problem and what's the solution? Now, if your only question is, what's the problem and what's the solution, your only answer can be about the how. How do you fix it? 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 And then we're just putting Band-Aids, right? We're just putting Band-Aids. 
And what we're doing, if you remember that the order matter slide, we're just bulldozing right past the why and the where, the when, the what, and going straight to the how. And so ultimately, that's a really reactive way to make decisions. And we're human. Of course, this is going to be the natural dynamic. Obviously, we're really good at knowing what we don't want. We're really good at trying to fix things. We want to fix things. That feels good. But when we really think about it, it's making decisions from that reactive standpoint. Now, he also studied groups that did what he called preferred futuring, what we're calling deep dive visioning today. And in these groups and in these individual scenarios, these are people who say, of course I have problems. Absolutely, I need to figure out the solutions. But for now, at this point in the process, I have got to let go of the how. I've just got to let it go. And Lippitt said it was like shackles coming off. I just got goosebumps again, right? It's like when you release yourself from the how, you open yourself up to so much more. Now that can be even more challenging when you're really good at the how, when you're really good at the tactics and the plan and figuring it out, right? Like as, by nature, the people at this conference are really good at figuring out the step-by-step -step how to get there. And we're gonna get there, we're gonna get to the how. But it's this idea that before we do that, let's back up. Why are we even doing this? Where are we going? When are we gonna get there? What is it gonna look like when we arrive? And so what that leads to is this, this visionary perspective shift. And it is all about moving towards what you do want instead of away from what you don't want, right? And if you take a moment, I'm gonna, we have more to cover. So we, we don't have time to go in, like, to give you time to think about this today, but this is definitely something that I want you to take back and think about. Think about times in your life, could be major, could be minor, where you have made a decision based on moving away from what you didn't want rather than towards what you did want. And when we make a decision to move away from what we don't want, we're gonna get somewhere. Doesn't actually necessarily mean we're getting towards what we do want, we're just getting away, right? But if we can make that decision and back up and say, but whoa, 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 what do I actually want? We are asking a different question, we're gonna get a different answer, we're gonna be making that decision from that visionary perspective. So you might be sitting here integrating, internalizing all of this information. And now you kind of want to get down a little bit more to the, the brass tacks. Okay, what are we talking about? So I want to take you guys through the four elements of an effective vision. Now, these are the same, whether it's an organizational vision or an individual vision. Again, today, just put that personal, personal lens on. The first, nope, that's the fourth. There we go. What's this first one? Scott, can you read this one out for me? It has got to get you out of bed. Yeah, it's got to get you out of bed in the morning. It's got to be exhilarating. You want it to give you butterflies in your stomach. You want this thing, again, to feel like that positive pull. And that vision has to have longevity. If it's a, mine's for 2028, 20, like it's got to get me out of bed for a lot of mornings, right? So it's got to be inspiring. But also, and Ashley, could you read this one for us? Yeah, so you have got to believe that you can get there even if you don't know how yet even if you don't know how. So again, remember like we're releasing the how, the beauty is this allows you to put things in your vision where you're like, I don't know the how. I can't even begin to think about the how, or I don't wanna prescribe the how, but in my heart of hearts, in my core, I know I can get there. So like in my, very, in my second vision, I was living in Birmingham, Alabama at the time, and I was making cold calls from a card table in the living room that had like no windows and like the tiny little light from the ceiling. And, and I was literally like cold calling in Alabama like about vision. And I got people who were like, ma'am, like I don't know what you're talking about. Can you like wrap this up? Like bless your heart, but like I'm hanging up. And I put in that vision that I wanted to be asked to speak internationally. And I'm sitting there being like, I wanna take it out. I wanna delete it. I do not wanna have this in my vision. That is scary. I have no clue. This is absurd. Like what am I thinking? But in my heart of hearts, I freaking knew I could make it happen and I kept it in and I've had the chance to go all over the world. And again, it's not magical. It's just that I was like, no, I'm getting there. I could drop myself in and see myself living that reality. And so then it was like, oh, it's on. I'm already there and I'm just catching up, right? So we want some of those things in your vision that kind of scare you a little bit, get you excited. But ultimately you gotta believe that you can get there. So it's gotta be at the intersection of inspiring and strategically sound right? I always tell people, I will help you write a vision. I will not help you write a fantasy. I'm not going to do it. So I will call people on that when they're writing their vision and they have this huge thing in there. I'm like, I love that. 
Is that, does that feel both inspiring and strategically sound? And that, yeah. I didn't mean to interrupt. That's okay. Did you say the intersection of what? Inspiring and strategically sound. Absolutely. And so then sometimes that conversation is, you know what, maybe that's like 10 years from now. And this is a five-year vision. And then amazing, instead of having to put all this pressure that, oh my gosh, I have to do that in this vision, then we just get to say, maybe that's the 10-year. What is the five, you know, on the way to that, what does that look like in five years? And now we get to turn it into something they really feel like they can get to instead of like, this is a dream. I can't even believe it myself, right? It's got to be documented why, why, why does it have to be documented? Why, why, why we gotta write this thing down? Any ideas? It's just a wish. Just a wish, keep changing, all this stuff. Well, be accountable, absolutely. And when you write it down, oh, like this whole topic of words, we could talk about all day. Words matter. Words really, really, really matter. And so doing that work of really thinking about how do I want to articulate this vision? How do I want to articulate my own definition of success and describe it and show what it's going to look like when I am there? Now we have the words for it. Now we can start making it happen. Now we start to look for those things. But oftentimes just like walking around with like goals and dreams and aspirations, like we're not really putting words to that. We're not really fleshing it out. It's just like, I want success. I want to be happy and like my family to be good. You know, it's like, okay, great. Me too. But if we really flesh it out, right, then we can start making it happen in a really, really powerful way. So got to be documented. And for all these other reasons as well, it helps us stay accountable. It keeps us really honest with ourselves. My amazing husband, who I wrote about in my second vision before I even knew him, he is the partner that I wrote about in my vision. But I'll tell you, every guy I did it before him, I broke up with them because I was honest with myself, came back to my vision, and I was like, I want them to be the guy in my vision because I just want to be normal and get married finally, but I can't. Like, they are not the guy in my vision. Like, I know. I know. And I read him my vision on, like, day two of dating. Like, I read him the entire thing, and I was like, this is where I'm headed. If you're down, like, let's go. If not, you know. So, I'm telling you, this thing, this thing has application, real, real life applications. Lastly, it's got to be shared. Some people look at me and they're like, Oh, I'm so sorry, what? You, you want me to share this? Absolutely not. You have got to share this vision. You have got to share this vision. But the power of sharing your vision is not about the receiving, it is about the sharing. We are not asking for permission or validation. We're telling people, hey, I went through this process. I clarified my vision. You've always been so supportive. I just want to share it with you. It's my final, no need for feedback. Because we also want to tell people, I'm not looking for you to like do a grammar check. Like, that's not what we want. And, you know, then you're figuring out who to share it with. And I have some people in my life who I adore and they're mentors. I never have shared my vision because they're going to yuck my yum. They're going to be the ones to be like, really? Let's talk about that. And I'm like, that's so not what this is about. You're missing the entire point. Right? So you also want to do that work to figure out who's on your sharing plan. Who are you going to share it with? And then you share that thing early and you share that thing often. Two weeks ago, I shared it with five new people, right? And I wrote it back in May. So you keep sharing it. And some people you share the whole thing with. Some people you just share parts of it with. But it's really, really incredible what happens when you can just say, I'm just going to send you that vision and you can read all about it. So making your vision a reality. We're doing so good on time. This formula for change that we're going to talk about today is going to become a framework that you are always going to have in your back pocket. I cannot tell you how many times I've written this thing on the back of a napkin, scrawled it on the back of a receipt, right? Once you know this, you are going to see how it applies to every area of your life. So this formula for change was developed decades, decades and decades ago in the field of organizational dynamics, all about large scale corporate change. Okay, that's awesome. But when I learned about it, when you guys learned about it today, you're going to see that this has implications for any change that we want to create. Because any change that we want to create, whether it's big or small, personal or professional, we are always going to come up against the natural resistance to that change. And why do we resist change? Why? Scary. It's uncomfortable. Sometimes we shouldn't actually do that thing, right? It's like, that is human. It's not bad. It's not wrong. It just is. That resistance is, is helpful at times. So a lot of times we're kind of taught to feel like, oh, like change is good and I should just want to do all the change and get past my comfort zone and I should just do it and do it and do it and do it. Sometimes, yes. And sometimes 
that resistance is trying to tell us something. So we don't want to think of it as bad or wrong or something that we have to get rid of. It's just there. Okay, that's, that's one critical variable. So the question becomes, how do we tip the scales? We got change on the one side, we've got resistance on the other, right? How do we tip those scales? And there's three variables in the middle, D, V, and F. D stands for dissatisfaction. Now raise your hand if dissatisfaction is like a negative word. Yeah, totally. You satisfy, you dissatisfy. Raise your hand if there's a gap between where you are and where you want to be. I would hope so, right? Every elite athlete has that healthy gap between where they are and where they, are, where they want to be, right? For our own personal and professional development, there's a gap, a healthy, good, important gap between where we are and where we want to be. If there's not a big enough gap between where we are and where we want to be, that change is not going to take hold. V, I know it's a big surprise, stands for vision, our definition of success at that specific point in the future. And then F stands for first steps of action, how we are actually going to get there. So we've got change on the one side. We've got resistance on the other side. We've got these three variables in the middle. Do they tip the scales? When we put it all together, we recognize that change, real, lasting, sustainable change can take hold when dissatisfaction multiplied by vision, multiplied by first steps of action are all greater than the natural resistance to change. But since you multiply these variables together, if any of those variables in the middle is a zero, what happens? All zero out. They all zero out. So this is something else that I really want you guys to take back home. Tonight, you're going to be too exhausted. Don't try to do it tonight. Totally fine. Right? On Monday or Sunday when you're having your coffee, take a look at this. And I want you to think about a specific change, a specific change that you've been trying to create, thank you, in your personal life that just hasn't hasn't, hasn't been getting the traction that you want. And just ask yourself, which of these variables is zeroing things out? And again, what this allows us to do is pinpoint what is going on with this dynamic. And then instead of just feeling like, I don't know, this change just isn't happening. I don't know why. It must be me. It's this external factor, whatever it is. You can just zero in. Oh, maybe I'm actually not that dissatisfied. And I've been trying so hard to do this thing, but like, I'm actually fine where I am. Great. Focus on a different change. Or I'm really dissatisfied. I have my vision, I just don't know what to do. Okay, great, let's help you figure out how to get there. Or, I'm dissatisfied, I've got the first steps, I'm amazing at the steps, I don't really have a vision to pull it all together, right? So bring this one, you, and again, you will start to see this in your family, you will start to see this in your executive team, you'll start to see this with your colleagues, how this is playing out. So the beauty is you can impact every single one of these variables, right? And ultimately, the visioning process Huh? Oh, no, no, no. Here we go. The visioning process maps to this equation. You go into the deep dive visioning process because you want to create a change. You are at that inflection point in your life, and there is a compelling reason to make that change. Now, instead of like six months from now or two years from now, you're just like, I am so not willing to have this haziness for another day. Can't do it. Cannot do it. Then, when you think about that dissatisfaction variable, you can't actually identify the gap between where you are and where you want to be if you don't really know where you are and you don't really know where you want to be. So a lot of times we walk around feeling like, yeah, there's something missing, or right? Like, eh. but we, we don't really know how big that gap is. Going through that process helps us identify where am I now and where do I really want to be? And then we can truly see what that gap looks like. Of course, if the vision is zeroing things out, it gives us that vision. And then we work backwards in that vision. We create the plan to get there. And it's not just any plan, it's not just any action steps, it is steps of action that are directly aligned with our vision. And are we gonna take missteps? steps? Of course we are, but we know that those steps are moving us in the right direction instead of just kind of all over the place where we end up exhausted and no farther than we were before. So uh, we have a little bit of time for Q&A. So I would love to answer any questions that come up for you guys. Yes, Marco. Okay, so I'm going to talk to you about the process in just a sec. You're amazing. Any other questions before we get there? The thing that you mentioned, the... Um... The social scientist? It's Ron, Ron Lippitt, L-I-P-P-I-T-T. 
L I P P I T T. Other questions? Okay. So, oh, okay, great. It has seen in your experience been successful applying it. So, this might sound like I'm lying, but I'm not. I've never, I've, and I'm truly like thinking back. I have never seen somebody not accelerate the life that they want to create after going through this process. Now, does some people make more of their vision a reality than others? Sure. But one of the parts of the process is really, really digging into what parts of your vision you want to be extremely specific about and what parts of your vision you want to leave intentionally vague. And so some people, and that's one of the things I work on them where I'm like, oh, this is like really, really specific and kind of prescriptive. Could we open that up? Could we make that a little bit more intentionally vague so it doesn't box you in, right? Or I've had people be like, oh, I really want to start a business. And I'm like, know them. And I'm like, mm, don't know if you really do. Let me ask, why do you want to start a business? Because I've never been able to find a place that's aligned with my values. What is she doing? She's making a decision based on moving away from what she doesn't want. Can't find a place that has my values. Got to start my own business. Whoa. Hold the phone. What about moving towards what you do want? I want to feel aligned. I want, to, oh great. Turns out there are other ways to do that than just starting your own business. So right, so we backed her up from that. So one of the reasons why people are successful is because they do the work to really peel back the layers and dig in. So when they get to that vision, again, it's that, that intersection of inspiring and strategically sound. So for, does that make sense? It's not magical, it's just for that reason that they really, really do that work. Such a good question. What other questions do you guys have? Okay, so Marco, back to you. So you may be thinking, that's all fine and well, where do I start? The good news is there's a process. You guys love a process, right? Who in this room loves a process? Me too, love a process, right? There is a process, there is a step by step process. Remember when I locked myself in that room and I said no one should ever have to do this alone? I knew that I could get people excited about vision, but if I didn't have literally a step-by-step -step process that built on itself, there's no way I was gonna ever get someone past like, oh cool, this vision thing sounds great, to like being able to have one for themselves. So I have broken it down. It is eight steps. You go through those steps, you are clear on your vision and your sharing plan and your roadmap and your own core values and your purpose, right? All those things through that process. So there is a process, but there is also a trap. The trap, is that when you go out into the world after this and you look at like visioning exercises on the internet, a lot of times they will tell you, okay, great, you wanna think about your future? What do you want your future to look like? That is a trap. That is a trap, right? Before you can even begin to think about your future, you've got to understand how you got to where you are. Then you've gotta really take stock of where you are now. Then you've peeled back enough layers to clarify your vision. Then you have your vision in place and can work backwards and you know how to get there, right? So I want you guys to avoid that trap. And so I put together this four-part framework, this foundational four-part framework, whether you're doing this for your organization, doing this individually, this is this framework for you guys. And I know we're like going QR code wild here today, but this QR code is where you guys can get this framework. So if you go to that QR code right now, you'll be able to not only get the framework, but you'll also be able to get all the session slides from today. So if you're like, wait, what was that thing with the, with the little squirrel? Like you'll have that, that slide too.